On July 16, 1980, Jeremy Stoner was born in California. He had three siblings. Justin was the younger brother and Jason and Joshua were the older brothers. Their home was in Vallejo, California, a charming and picturesque community in its own right. Jeremy was a contented and lively youngster. He was devoted to both his friends and family. Attending school and picking up new skills was something he cherished. He also enjoyed watching cartoons, playing with his toys, and riding his bike. He had a huge heart and a bright smile. It was February 21, 1987, on a Saturday morning, when six-year-old Jeremy and his two older brothers, aged 11 and 9 years, were playing outside close to their home. A relative was keeping an eye on Jeremy and his brothers while their parents were at work. Their relative had to abruptly depart to take her sick daughter to the hospital. The boys were instructed to wait at home for their parents to return. Rather, they made their way to a neighbor's residence. While they were there, a neighbor scolded Jeremy for spilling ketchup, and they left right after. At 5 p.m., the boy's mother came home to find the house unoccupied, leading her to believe that the boys were playing at the neighbors, as they frequently did. However, when the two older boys returned two hours later without Jeremy, the family initiated a search. They contacted the police, since Jeremy was nowhere to be found. It didn't take long for Vallejo police to conclude that Jeremy had been abducted. He was last seen, according to reports at a Dairy Queen on Springs Road, which is roughly five minutes' walk from the family's house. Around 7.30 that evening, a worker there reported to the investigators that he had seen Jeremy with an adult guy. Four days later, on February 25, 1987, Jeremy's body was discovered on Sherman Island in Sacramento County. Four people heading along Sherman Island Road in the Delta became bogged in the mud. In search of something to put between the tires, the driver got out. What she rather found was a small boy's body. He had been beaten, stabbed, and choked. They contacted the authorities and informed them of their discovery. Investigators quickly made their way to the crime scene and gathered all the evidence they could and stored it for later use. In Vallejo, word of Jeremy's passing traveled fast. The people were horrified by what had happened to him and were devastated. They wanted to do everything in their power to help his family since they felt bad for them. They hugged them and handed them flowers and cards. When Jeremy vanished, they looked for him. They held a candlelight vigil. They offered prayers for him and his family as well. Terry Kurtola was Vallejo's mayor at the time. He claimed that for four days, the residents of Vallejo joined the Stoner family. He restated that they had looked, prayed, and wept for him. It wasn't long until a suspect walked right inside the Vallejo Police Department. Approximately a week after Jeremy's death, Sean Quincy Melton, an unemployed security guard, informed authorities he could have information regarding the case. Melton acknowledged that he tried to dazzle police with his rudimentary research. To use his own words, he aspired to be a big shot. However, Melton's gradual change from a swaggering detective to a confused crime suspect was captured on camera throughout his interrogation. He had a terrible past and a disturbing mentality, as indicated by his authorship of The Wolf's Den, a book about child exploitation. Despite his insistence that it's a work of fiction, others questioned whether it was completely unrelated to his personal experiences. Sean Melton willingly went to the police station to give details about the case. He mentioned that he had heard tales and seen certain things that could help identify the offender. The police, however, suspected that he was involved in the crime. There was good cause for them to be skeptical about Sean Melton. Prior to his appointment, Sean Melton's psychologist reported to the police that he had admitted to having unsettling ideas about young boys. The doctor voiced worries that Sean Melton might be dangerous and might be connected to the case of Jeremy Stoner. Sean Melton was the target of a lengthy 30-hour interview by the police, during which they tested him with a polygraph and asked a lot of questions. 
They also drew a sketch of him and contrasted it with the kidnapper's description provided by a witness. Their aim was to gather intelligence and possibly determine his connection to the case. Sean Melton adamantly maintained his innocence, stating that he was unaware of the situation and denied any role in the crime. The polygraph test was successfully completed by him and the sketch of him did not match the witness's account. He insisted that his only goal was to help the police crack the case. Still, the police continued to pursue Sean Melton and proposed a fresh theory. They claimed Sean Melton had numerous personality disorders and speculate that the crime may have been committed by one of his alter egos, John Wolfe. They asserted that Sean Melton did not recall committing these acts. In retaliation, the police detained Sean Melton and accused him of kidnapping and killing Jeremy. However, there was insufficient evidence to convict him. There were two trials, but the jury were unable to come to a unanimous decision in both cases. The judge was forced to dismiss the case as a result. Sean Melton died in 2000, but he never acknowledged having anything to do with the terrible end of Jeremy Stoner. Because there had been no development and no new leads or evidence, the Jeremy Stoner case was labeled a cold case and went unresolved for several years. However, there was a noteworthy advancement in Jeremy Stoner's situation in 2023. Thanks to cutting-edge technology, the authorities were able to obtain a fresh lead through DNA testing. Jeremy's remain samples were compared to those in a criminal database by the police via DNA testing. This development promised to throw fresh light on the enduring enigma surrounding Jeremy's terrible end. When the police discovered a match, they eventually located the offender. The name of the perpetrator is Fred Kane III. 69 years old Kane was taken into custody from his Central Point, Oregon residence. District Attorney Krishna Abrams expressed gratitude for having cold case investigators who are so committed to solving these horrifying murders, regardless of the passage of time. According to 1984 media accounts, Kane, who was 30 at the time, was allegedly accused of attacking a 17-year-old in San Bernardino County. On suspicion of attacking the teenager at knife point, Kane and his roommate were taken into custody. Kane was charged with forceful assault and weapon usage, with enhancements for four previous jail terms, but a jury ruled him not guilty later that year. Because the investigation is still underway, the District Attorney's Office for Solano County has stated that it will not be providing any more information, but Martinez police have probably noticed Kane's arrest. From the start, Jeremy's case and Eric Coy's were frequently brought up in the same sentence. Just one month before Jeremy's disappearance, on January 19, 1987, nine-year-old Eric rode his bike from his Martinez home to a relative's house. Eric rode the trip frequently and knew it well. He left his house at about 11 in the morning knowing that once he got to his relative's house, a few blocks away, he would call just like he always did. After he failed to return home, a search was conducted. His remains were discovered not far from Martinez Junior High School. After receiving about a dozen stab wounds, he passed away from his wounds. Eric's case hasn't been resolved as of yet. We are asking anyone with information on this case to contact the cold case unit of the district attorney at 7077-848477. On September 28, 2023, Kane appeared in Solano County Court for the first time. When Kane was taken into the courtroom, Jeremy Stoner's family was present. I'm not sure whether this is a relief, said Jeremy's mother, Karen Tabler. Definitely not feeling well. It was difficult, she said to be in the same room as Kane. Solano County Chief Deputy District Attorney Paul Sequara stated, I have been around a long time, but I don't think you'll ever get closure. Although, I have never witnessed actual closure for a family. I believe that knowing that someone would be held accountable would be somewhat consoling. 
The Los Angeles police believe that Sherry Rasmussen's murder was the result of a burglary gone wrong, which is why the case remained cold for almost three decades. Then, when a detective examined the cold case file one fateful morning in 2009, he discovered his first hint that the murderer had been hiding there in front of them all along. Sherry Rasmussen was the love of John Ruetten's life. The couple first met in the summer of 1984. Sherry was a tall Scandinavian beauty with light brown hair. She had a broad face with high cheekbones and a wide set of eyes beneath heavy, arching eyebrows. John Ruetten was an outspoken and endearing young guy with a thick mop of dark hair that made him look like a male model. Cherie and John were athletic and were runners on fast track. At age 25, John Ruetten was a recent University of California Los Angeles graduate, and Cherry, who was two years older, was the nursing director at the Glendale Adventist Medical Center. Cherry was quite slick. She had enrolled in Loma Linda University at the age of 16, and at the time of her murder, she gave critical care nursing lectures all over the world. She was thought to be intelligent and gorgeous. She was also focused and self-assured. She was an embodiment of the kind of person John aspired to be, or, to put it another way, the way he viewed himself at his best. Sherry also had a strong attraction to John. Their bond was effortless and quick. When they met, all of their previous relationships and future ambitions seemed to simply dissolve. They connected and soon became a wedded couple. Their wedding took place in November 1985. After a busy post-wedding holiday season that included joyful visits to both sets of parents, they were settling into their married life pretty easily by the following year. On February 24, 1986, John had begun working at an engineering firm. Sherry was still in bed when he left their Van Nuys apartment in California for work that day. The couple had gone to see a movie the previous night. That Monday morning, Cherie was scheduled to give a motivational speech at work, a managerial tactic she did not feel was effective. She then informed John that she was considering just calling in sick, using a back pain she had suffered while doing aerobics the day before, as an excuse. John advised her to go to work and get the speech over with. When John left the front door at around 7.20 a.m., Sherry was still contemplating her options under the covers. On other days, Sherry usually left first for work. John dropped off some laundry on his way to work and arrived at his desk just before 8 o'clock. He considered contacting Sherry, but he didn't want to wake her up if she was planning on sleeping in. Midway through the day, he called home and believed she had changed her mind about going to work when there was no response. He soon tried to call her office line. Her secretary informed him that she had not yet seen Sherry. The secretary claimed that on Mondays, when Sherry taught her classes, she occasionally failed to stop by her office at all. John made three or four more attempts to contact their home, but still there was no response. Although it was strange, but Sherry occasionally forgot to switch on the answering machine, John didn't seem really bothered. After the close of work, he ran a few errands, stopping at a UPS store and at the dry cleaner to pick up the laundry he dropped off that morning. On getting home, he was surprised to see the door of the garage opened. The Balboa townhomes were made out of white, three-story mock Tudor structures with back alley garage access. A little balcony was located just over the garage, in front of two sliding glass doors. His and Sherry's cars would just fit in the garage perfectly. However, the BMW he gifted Sherry on their engagement was not in sight. Glass fragments were scattered across the pavement near the garage entry. John immediately assumed that this was glass from a car window. According to him, Sherry must have accidentally run into something while she pulled out. She had clipped the door and damaged the aerial on her car a few weeks prior. Oh dear, what did she do now? John had wondered. John removed the dry cleaning in a plastic bag from the vehicle and ascended the steps leading from the garage to the living room. He didn't start to get worried until he noticed that the inner door to their living room was slightly ajar. He carefully opened the door to peer inside. The sight he saw was one he wouldn't have ever imagined. 
His wife, who had been lively and chatty a few hours ago, was lying lifeless on the living room floor. Her face was swollen, bruised, and bloodied as she lay on the dark rug with her back to it. She was wearing her red bathrobe and had no shoes on. John initially believed she could be asleep, but as soon as he saw her face, he knew something was terribly wrong. Those who pass away violently stop moving in mid-stride, frequently with a frozen expression of final shock. Sherry's long, delicate leg was slightly raised and bowed at the knee. Her robe was flung open, and her arms were raised and bent as if she was struggling to stand up. When John touched her leg, it felt rigid. Her body was so cold. In order to check for a pulse, he pressed his fingers to her wrist, but there wasn't any. John was struck. He had heard about murders. In Los Angeles, there would be 831 homicides that year. However, learning about them never gave him hope that something similar may happen to him. Sherry was right in front of him, still shockingly and vividly present to him in every manner, yet completely, irrevocably gone. Her right eyelid was purple, swollen, and closed, and her face was coated in dried blood. Her mouth was open in a final gasp, and her left eye was open and looked up. For hours, she had been dead. A black bullet hole was located in the exact middle of her chest, just below the rim of her exquisite form, fitting pink camisole. A terrified John called 911. In 1986, the crime scene was extensively recorded. There seems to have been a brawl. The top of a tall stereo speaker from the room was laying next to Sherry on the rug, flushed against her head. It no longer had any wires attached to it. A broken vase made of gray ceramic with a substantial base was on the ground. The shelves of the hardwood display cabinets were crooked, and a receiver and amplifier protruded forward from the top of the television. A VCR and a CD player were neatly placed at the bottom of the stairs leading from the living room to the second floor, as if they had been assembled for carrying, but were then left behind. The top of the CD player had a single bloody smudge on it. On the east wall and the entrance door, there were blood streaks. Two cords that were braided could be seen on the floor right inside the front entrance. One of them appeared to be the speaker's wire. One of the two glass sliding doors to the back balcony on the second floor was broken. This was the glass John had noticed on the sidewalk in front of the garage. Other than the items left on the living room floor, there was no indication of forced entry or theft. However, it was later discovered that Sherry and John's marriage certificate had been taken by the murderer. Homicide detective Lyle Mayer found a pink and pale green quilted blanket on the living room chair that had a bullet hole in it and powder burns. A gun had been placed against Sherry's chest after the first shot and fired twice point blank, leaving two of what turned out to be three holes in her chest. The blanket had been used by the murderer to block out sound. One of the two thirty-eight caliber bullets that were found in Sherry's body must have gone straight through her. These three shots by themselves would have all been instantly lethal. Someone had intended to erase her from the Earth's surface for good. There was a bite mark on her inner left forearm. A cast was obtained for potential teeth comparison, and the bite mark was swabbed for saliva samples. Police investigators working under Lyle Mayer's direction questioned neighbors, family members, and friends over the ensuing weeks, but they were unable to identify any suspects. A week later, Sherry's silver BMW with the keys in the ignition was discovered parked on a street in Van Nuys. It had many fingerprints, a blood stain, and a strand of brown hair. According to research and community interviews, Two Latin guys had been breaking into houses in the vicinity, and during one of those break-ins, they had abused a woman. Detectives Mayer's viewpoint from the day of the murder would not change. He claimed the homicide resulted from a robbery gone wrong. However, Nels Rasmussen, Sherry's father, was of the opinion that John's ex-girlfriend, Stephanie Lazarus, who was a cop at the time, killed his daughter. In the months after Sherry and John moved in together, Sherry had confided in her father numerous times. 
She claimed that Stephanie Lazarus and John attended the same college and got intimate once or twice, but never made their relationship official. On John's 25th birthday, Stephanie threw a surprise birthday party for him. Unknowingly to her, John was seeing someone else. John never considered Stephanie as a girlfriend, and so he had to let her know that he was now in a serious relationship with Sherry. Stephanie, however, was obviously obsessed with John and wouldn't accept that. She subsequently showed up around John and Sherry. Stephanie Lazarus was athletic, bold, and had black hair. According to Sherry, she had unexpectedly visited their home a few weeks prior to their wedding. She went over to the apartment and left a set of water skis for John to wax. The skis, according to Sherry's father, were nothing more than a pretext for intrusion and a provocative act. Sherry didn't like that another woman was intruding their home. She and John had a dispute over Stephanie. John, however, informed her that he and Stephanie were no longer together and that their relationship had never grown that serious, explaining that they had been dorm mates long before lovers. Sherry, however, did not want John to wax those skis. Nels claimed that John did not support Sherry and would not defend her against Stephanie. Instead, he advised Sherry to appease her. Sherry informed her father that the lady police officer had returned unannounced to pick up the skis that John had waxed against her protests. That time, when John handed her the skis, she made it clear that the woman was not welcome and requested her to go. Stephanie had not been at all discouraged by this. She had returned, this time wearing a Los Angeles Police Department outfit and carrying a revolver around her waist. She claimed to be taking a break. John wasn't around. Usually, it was John who remained at home while Sherry left for work. Sherry immediately questioned if this was a regular occurrence. Fiancé leaves for work. An ex-girlfriend drops by. She didn't want to accept it as true. She wished to believe John. A few weeks remained till the wedding. Sherry did not cry easily, but one evening, she broke down when talking to her father on the phone. When she and John traveled to Tucson for her birthday, she and her father spoke about it more. Nels reported that his daughter expressed a want for John to intervene and tell Stephanie to leave them alone. But all John ever did was reassure her that he and Stephanie weren't dating and that the best course of action was to ignore her until she eventually left. Nels recalled the visit Stephanie Lazarus made to Sherry's office at the hospital. Sherry had thoroughly described this meeting to her father. She claimed that Stephanie barged into her Glendale office and did so without waiting for the secretary to open the door. This time, the female police officer wore tight shorts and a tube top, an attire that screamed her athleticism and sexiness. She then made a chilling remark that says, If I can't have John, nobody else will, before leaving Sherry's office. Nils Rasmussen told Detective Lyle Meyer all of these in an interview a day after Sherry's murder, just shortly after he had asked the detective the simple question, have you checked out John's ex-girlfriend, the lady cop? Detective Mayer, however, discarded Nils' questions and testimonies. He then told Nils that he had watched too many TV cop shows. Also, John had contested Nils' claims. He assured Detective Mayer that his father-in-law's descriptions of the encounters were not accurate if Sherry hadn't informed him of them. Detective Mayer stuck to the robbery theory. Nels was shown sketches of two Latin male suspects shortly after the murder, and the burglary scenario was explained. He was unable to identify the sketches, and the overall situation was incomprehensible to him. He had to question the professionalism of these detectives. The residents had evidence of a fight. According to Detective Meyer, the fight might have continued for an hour and a half. Nels questioned how his daughter had managed to hold off two men for so long. Based on the bite mark on the Sherry's forearm, there was speculation that the murderer was a female, given that women tend to bite during a fight. But the idea was rejected. Along with the hole and powder burns on the blanket, Sherry also had a bullet wound in the middle of her chest. Nels was informed by Meyer that his daughter had been assassinated, not only shot and killed, 
He wondered why a random thief would just come to assassinate a person without taking anything of value in the house. Nels questioned the detectives if they had checked to see if the female police officer was on duty that day. He asked them if they had inspected or photographed her, but the answers were no. Stephanie Lazarus was never contacted by anyone. Sherry Rasmussen's case went cold, and the evidence of her murder was filed away in the commercial storage. Detective Mayers retired in the coming years, and several years were spent by Nels Rasmussen trying to get his daughter's case reopened. In the long run, many investigators declined to do it, and the investigation didn't pick up again until DNA testing was made accessible. In 2001, Sherry Rasmussen's case was reopened for reinvestigation after a committed Los Angeles Police Department homicide team used new technologies to work on old forensic investigations, but detectives were soon left looking for missing evidence on Sherry's case file. Luckily, in 2004, criminalist Jennifer Francis discovered the missing cotton swab containing DNA from the bite mark on Sherry's forearm. The DNA sample was entered into CODIS, and there was no match. However, the saliva and bite mark were determined to belong to a female, disproving the initial theory that a male burglar was responsible. After this discovery, the case was abandoned once more. In 2009, the Los Angeles Police Department renewed the case. After revisiting the documented crime scene, it was determined that the murderer arranged the crime scene to look like a burglary in order to put police off the case. In the notes from the initial investigation, detectives ultimately discovered a single sentence where Stephanie Lazarus's name came up once in the entire case file. Investigators, however, chose to follow the tip. They contacted John Ruetten, who is now remarried with kids. He told them that Stephanie Lazarus had indeed been his ex-girlfriend and her being Sherry's killer was all Nils Rasmussen's theory. He again said he didn't believe she did it. Investigators contacted Nels Rasmussen after two decades. Nels was angry at first because the police department wouldn't interview the killer of his child. However, after a positive feedback from the new detectives, he recounted what he had told investigators in the initial phase of the investigation. The detectives were shocked that all his revelations were never documented. When the detectives discovered that Stephanie Lazarus was a police officer, they ran her name through the department directory and came up with their esteemed colleague in the art theft division. She was a reputable figure in the department and had over the years been promoted for her diligence. Regardless, the detectives began to look into their colleague's whereabouts on the day of Sherry's murder. They knew as a cop she would be very careful if she wanted to commit a murder. They soon discovered that she was off duty the day Sherry was killed. They looked into the murder weapon. The investigators were aware that most police officers possess at least two weapons, one for duty and one for backup, both legally acquired and registered. Records revealed that Stephanie Lazarus had bought a backup 38 caliber Smith Wesson revolver not long after graduating police academy. Detectives tracked the Smith & Wesson revolver used as a backup by Lazarus. It was discovered that Lazarus had notified the Santa Monica police in March 1986, just a few weeks after the murder, that the gun had been stolen. If investigators had been looking at Stephanie Lazarus back in 1986, they would have had access to all of this information. But they did not bother at all. The pattern in the evidence missing from the case file was now starting to become apparent to the detectives. It unmistakably appeared that someone inside the police department had been attempting to protect her. This was something Sherry's father knew, and what made him angry at the Los Angeles Police Department for many years. The team of homicide detectives then decided to conceal the investigation until they find answers to apprehend police officer Stephanie Lazarus. They needed a DNA from her, and so, a special operations team secretly followed her and her adopted daughter to Costco. When they stopped for a snack at a table outside the building, the team was able to recover the cup and straw she had been using. Two days later, 
The lab determined that the mouth on that straw was the mouth that had bitten Sherry Rasmussen's forearm during a violent battle 23 years earlier. During an interview in March 2009, Stephanie denied ever killing Sherry, but was ultimately arrested. Two years later, in March 2012, Stephanie Lazarus was found guilty of killing Sherry Rasmussen. She was given a 27-year sentence. She and the Los Angeles Police Department have been sued by the Rasmussens. An appeal has been filed against a preliminary judgment declaring the department exempt from similar cases. The police department was reinvestigated, but it turned up no proof of an internal cover-up. The missing evidence from the case file still remains a mystery till today. On May 11, 2007, 64 years old, Dennis Lee First was found deceased in his condominium in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. He had died from beatings and stabbings. Tammy Mimes, the assistant manager of the Hawthorne Hills Apartments, where Dennis lives, informed the police that he had prostate cancer. He had few visitors and lived off of Social Security. Tammy said she got a call from a friend asking her to check on Dennis, and she told the apartment's maintenance worker, Robert Gross. Robert knocked on Dennis's door several times. He entered the house after not hearing back. He found Dennis there, lying face up on the bed with his feet propped up on the floor. Robert called 911 as soon as he noticed there was a lot of blood. The evidence collected at the scene was carefully submitted for examination to the State Crime Lab of the Iowa Division of Criminal Investigation. Dennis's first wife, Christine Griffin, claimed that he had a challenging life. It's unbelievable that someone would stab him. He could hardly get around. Dennis and Christine had two children. Their son Brad was born in 1963 and their daughter Laura was born in 1965. In the 1970s, the couple lived in Olin Jones County, where Dennis worked for the Monticello Steel Company as a purchasing agent. Dennis has lived in Cedar Rapids since the divorce in 1981. In 1990, Dennis was arrested on charges of driving under the influence and stealing from local businesses. Furthermore, he was accused of threatening a man whose room he had rented. After Dennis's son died in a car accident in 1993, his life didn't get any better. Dennis, who had initially lost contact with his daughter, his ex-wife, and other family members, started reaching out to them again a few years before he died in late May 2007. During the investigation into Dennis's death, Cedar Rapids police executed five search warrants. They looked through Dennis's apartment and also the apartment of a man named Curtis Paget, whom witnesses said must have had an argument with the victim. Curtis's fingerprints and a DNA sample from a cheek swab were gathered by investigators. Additionally, they took a pair of his boots from his apartment. Curtis Paget is also said to be a person of interest in an unrelated missing person case. He was the last person to have seen 15-year-old Erin Pospisil before she disappeared from Cedar Rapids on June 3, 2001. When the police questioned him at the time, Curtis mentioned that in 2001, having gone to visit Erin's elder brother, who was a friend of his, he and Erin departed the Pospisil family home, and he offered to give Erin a ride to her destination, which was her friend, Brett's house. According to Curtis, on getting to Brett's residence, there was no one at the house. Shortly after, a black Chevrolet Cavalier with tinted rear windows pulled up to the curb as Erin was making her way back to his truck. Curtis said Erin went up to the car and had a quick conversation with those in it. Before getting into the back seat of the Cavaliers, she told Curtis that the guys in the car would give her a ride. Ever since Erin left her home with Curtis Paget, she has never been seen or heard from again. No additional witnesses have been found by the police to corroborate Paget's report of seeing a black cavalier in the neighborhood. However, on March 1, 2023, 42-year-old Curtis Randall Paget was taken into custody and charged with Dennis First's murder. This specific case 
demonstrates the Cedar Rapids Police Department's commitment to the community and its victims. According to Lynn County Attorney Nick Maybanks, this incident shows the department's determination to bring victims and survivors' rights to justice, even in cases where the general public may not be aware of them. After several months of investigation and a recent last meeting, Maybanks came to the conclusion that Paget was to blame for Dennis's demise. The reason Paget was arrested was not disclosed by the police, nor was it indicated if additional DNA testing was necessary after the department's cold case team approached them to assess the situation. Still, during the press conference, a partial blood boot print that matched boots discovered at Paget's house was disclosed. An oven mitt smeared with blood was also found. The oven mitt's interior contains DNA from Paget and Dennis. Additionally, Paget's fingerprint was found on a knife sharpener and in a drawer in Dennis's apartment. Since her sighting in the spring of 2002, Erin's case has not further progressed. Erin was spotted in a convenience store in Cedar Rapids. She was in an automobile with Illinois license plates in the back seat. Cedar Rapids police received this report, but the car was nowhere to be found. They have never been able to verify the sighting. The person who saw Erin is still positive that it was her because he was familiar with her. Erin's features describe her as a Caucasian female with dark brown hair and eyes. When Erin disappeared, her hair had red highlights and there was a small scar above her eye. If you know anything about her or the case, call the Cedar Rapids Police Department.